Welcome to the second to last edition of our Black History version of 10 Questions with NBC10 Boston. I am Kwani Lunas. Today's guest is the first Black mayor to be popularly elected in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Seti Warren, thank you so much for giving us some time today. So great to be with you. Real pleasure. How's your day going? <laughs> it's going, you know? <laughs> it's good. All good. I do want to first congratulate you. I saw yesterday that you were named to a new role at the Harvard Kennedy School. For those who don't know, you are now the executive director of the, oh, excuse me, you are the executive director of the Institute of Politics that's effective March 15th. What is that new role going to look like? Well, um, I am really thrilled uh, to be taking it on. I, you know, a, a few things about it that I think uh, are exciting and important. One, realizing this this important moment we're in in regard to politics uh where i believe a few things are happening one there are new voices that are being elevated that are really important in regard to uh race and and social justice second uh we saw what happened in the last year uh we had the george floyd film and i think a lot of folks in the white community it it, it has awakened their consciousness about racism. Um, and the second piece is what happened at the Capitol. I think both of those events are very, very significant in regard to telling a story as to where our politics are. So I'm, in, I'm excited to um, engage with our students directly, make sure, you know, they're prepared to, to enter the world of politics and public service in a way that will, that will do good uh, for people. And then realizing uh, this, this incredible platform that is not just a national platform, but international platform, um, and, and meeting that moment in politics uh, with the IOP and their team is something I'm really excited about. And right now you are still the executive director of the Shorenstein Center on Media Politics and Public Policy. So I'm sure now you're gonna narrow it down to just the politics focus. But what has that, what has that role entailed of right now when you were working or are working with this? Well, I've been at the Shortenstein Center for a little over two years, as you mentioned, public pol media, public policy um, and politics. You know, a few things um, I'm really I'm really pleased about the, the, the kind of impactful work uh, the center's doing that I've helped to grow. Um, we have a really uh, sort of groundbreaking program around anti-racism, um, the institutional anti-racism, racism and accountability project led by a scholar, uh, Dr. Khalil Muhammad, uh, who's uh, at the school. I've really enjoyed working with him and his team to establish um, a portal that you can find online uh, where you can really understand uh, the research of, of how to break down um, and, and approach anti-racism work in institutions, what works, what doesn't work. I'm really pleased of, of, about growing, helping to grow that project. Really pleased about another project we have around misinformation and disinformation uh, that's really impactful. That's technology and social change project led by Dr. Joan Donovan uh, is important. And there's a host of other programs I've, I've been pleased to help support and grow and, and amplify. That sounds really fascinating, especially the one about misinformation. Is that geared towards the media um, aspect yeah. of the program? Yes, it's uh, it is geared towards the media because, as we've seen over time, uh, the media can be manipulated by by deliberate disinformation campaigns and actually amplify bad things. And so, uh, the project really aims to stop that from happening and give the media tools uh, to prevent that from happening. That sounds really good. And. I mentioned that you were the first popularly elected African-American mayor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But what I find to be even more fascinating is the fact that you were born in Newton, raised there, went to school there, stayed in the area to go to Boston College. Was that always a goal when you were growing up to specifically be a mayor in your home city? No, you know, I, I really didn't uh, have that vision. And just a little bit about my background, if I can, um, mm -hmm. you know, like many African-American families, uh, you know, tracing back, I won't go too far back, but my grandmother migrated uh, to, to New York uh, from North Carolina. And uh, that's where my, my dad was born. That's where my mom was born, uh, Harlem in the Bronx. My dad uh, grew up in a really tough neighborhood and actually joined 
the military uh, to, to get out of that life. And he was a Korean War veteran. Incidentally, my grandfather uh, was a World War II veteran. Oh. Um, and uh, my dad came home from, from uh, the Korean War and went to school. And this is what I find to be really powerful. And then I'll move to me. Um, my dad went to North Carolina a t but he marched in the civil rights movement. He was part of the group of, of students that, that did some of the first sit-ins in Greensboro. Oh. And, um, you know, he was jailed three times. Here's a Korean War veteran, right, uh, who served the country, put his life on the line, and he's on the, he's on the you know, front lines of, of, of justice. And, by the way, my grandfather, you know, comes home from, from the war, and the white GIs are, are being given land in the suburbs and housing, and, you know, he's in the inner city of, of uh, New York. That being said, uh, my dad moved to Massachusetts to attain a graduate degree, my dad and mom, and he bought a home in Newton with his GI Bill benefits. Mm -hmm. And that's the house that me and my sisters grew up in, and that's uh, the house where I live today with my wife and two children. And my dad was able to uh, to see me get sworn in as mayor. Um, he, uh, you know, January one, uh, 2010. He died three months later. But um, you know, he used to say to me in his lifetime, he never thought he'd see something like that. And you know, part of that journey for me has always been thinking um, and and understanding that that my story is not common. Um, and in fact, the, the opportunity for black families to do what I just said, is just continues to plummet and decrease. So, um, you know, one of the things I think about and, and one of the things I've tried to do um, when I was mayor uh, and even now, as I think about the IOP work, is how do we how do we how do we expose these questions, these disparities and how do we highlight them to the media, public policymakers? Um, and maybe begin to to turn a tide here, uh, but uh, you know that is part of the the, the journey. Incident, Emily, the other piece I just mentioned, mm -hmm. I joined the military, uh, enlisted, and I'm an I'm an Iraq War veteran, and so I'm a three generation, uh, you know, military service family. My dad always sort of really was so impactful with me, made it clear, you know, if it weren't for 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 black people, this country may not even exist for many different reasons. We know the history uh, and that, you know, black people are just as much a part of the building blocks of this country as anyone else. Uh, and uh, that was his message to me. And it continues to, that continues to resonate with me as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the military component, I think, is one that is very important as well. You mentioned black Americans that are able to go abroad and fight for their country. But also, I appreciate you sharing your background because I knew that your dad was in the military. I didn't know your grandfather was as well. Do you see a correlation with the military service and the political world? Because it seems like you and your dad did had the same kind of track when it came to that career path. Yeah, that's an interesting that's an interesting question. You know, there is there has been a, a tradition, right, of of people who serve and then go into public life and public service. Um, you know, I don't know what the what the data is, but one of the things that my dad infused in me is is you know whatever you do in life, make sure that you understand what you have and make sure you do everything you can uh, to help lift, you know, bring about justice for people that that look like us, that came from, from our means. And so, you know, part of my desire to be in public service is, is that, you know, that, that sort of ingrained push in my, in my DNA to, to, to serve and use Politics ultimately, those are the decision makers, right? The, the politicians, at any rate, whether it's mayor, uh, senators, governors, they're making deliberate decisions about our lives. So, yeah, I think I think there is a correlation, and and that was the message that was infused in me growing up. And in addition to you having the politics in your family, you seem to decide to be in politics at a pretty young age. You went to Newton North High School and ran for presidency there, as well as Boston College. But what is your earliest memory of you saying, I want to be in politics? This is how I want to make a difference. Well, you know, I to your point, you know, my dad uh, was in uh, the Dukakis administration in 1978 to uh, 82. And um, I'll never forget part of it. He was assistant secretary of education. 
And I'll never forget, he was, uh, you know, part of a group of people that were working to make sure the Boston schools were desegregated at that time. So he'd go into these community meetings and places and he'd, you know, monitor to make sure they were making the right decisions. And as a young kid, I remember him talking and adults talking about the work he was doing. And, you know, at a certain point, um, probably middle school, you know, before I entered Newton North, around the time I entered Newton North, you know, I, I started having these conversations about what, what my dad does and, and why it's important and why is education important for people and why do we have to make changes? And so I think it was around that time, middle school, um, after I learned about my father's, you know, work. And then the other piece uh, is there was a terrible incident um, when my family moved to Newton in 1972, where my mom was uh, strolling me and my twin sister down our street, down towards Newton North. And um, my parents had just moved in. A bunch of teenagers started throwing rocks, racial epithets at my mom. She came running back. She called my father, who was um, working at Brandeis at the time, still working towards his degree. He was furious. And, and I'll never forget, my dad told me this story when I was old enough probably, you know, again, around that same time. And he said, I called the mayor and he said, I used some choice language to, to the mayor, current mayor of Newton, but the mayor of Newton at that time, Mayor Mann, about how can this happen in, the, in your city? And of course, what happened after that is my, the mayor figured out how to get my dad to help make the city better. Yeah. So my dad started serving on all these commissions and work with the black citizens of Newton to try to, you know, hold people accountable for behavior in the schools, outside, and um, they they developed a great close friendship. The mayor, the mayor of uh, of Newton, and my father, Mayor Mann, and he told me that story. And so I, you know, being around that, I decided, you know, why why can't I do this? Why can't I put my name on the ballot as a freshman in school and and, and lead people? You know, even though the school was predominant is it is predominantly white why not? And I, and, and it, it went, it went from there. So. And you, you definitely found yourself in predominantly white institutions, cities for most of your career. How has that been for you when you find yourself a lot of times being the only maybe person of color in the room and still having to be assertive and say, I belong here. and I know what I'm doing. I love that question. I never, you know, I hardly ever get that question. And, you know, I, I really credit my parents at an early age. Um, and they, they really took, you know, me and my sisters through two things. One, really being deliberate about black history, right? Oftentimes, and I'm doing this with my kids now, oftentimes in the classroom, the only time you, the first time you learn about black people are slavery and Martin Luther King, right? And that's it. There's no history about the great African uh, nations, um, that were worldwide leaders well before slavery, um, going you know centuries back. There's no real understanding of players and leaders, even uh, you know during the time of slavery, post-slavery, Reconstruction. What did that mean? Post-Reconstruction, there were actually senators uh, and leaders uh, during Reconstruction. All those things, I think. So that was one. They really did a deep dive on, on educating us. And the second thing they made it clear is um, you're going to be messaged that you're not as good as other as white people. You're going to get that message in subtle ways, direct ways. And they said, it's just not true. And and you can go as far as you want to be. You can be who you want to be. You may have to work harder and do things differently. And people are going to treat you differently. So I was blessed. Um, along with my sisters, that we got that training early so that when I had to navigate these environments, which were, you know, not friendly all the time, right? I mean, I will never forget uh, when I was running uh, for, for student body president at Boston College, one of my opponents, and you'll appreciate this, it was when it was the Dust Bowl, oh. at BC, right in the Dust Bowl, where they put all the signs up and he and he came up to me and he said um i, I was running with a with a, a woman at, at the time he said a black man and a woman will never be student body president 
and vice president at this school ever. And that's why you're going to lose. This was in, by the way, he didn't whisper this to me. He didn't, this wasn't a, you know, there were people around, mm -hmm. right? And, and it, that was sort of openly talked about, accepted. This is, you know, 1990 or whatever it was. Um, but again, you know, I never let those situations ever deter me from moving ahead, leading, um, making the right decisions or decisions that I thought were right. And, you know, I, I faced all different types of rooms through college, even as mayor of uh, Newton and in city hall and other places. So, um, but I, I credit, I really credit um, my parents to help navigate that. And you did mention Boston College. Why did you choose BC other than it being right next door to you? <laughs> that is such a great, you know, I, um, it was actually not really that complicated. <laughs> it wasn't really like this vision I had. Yeah. Um, I had, my, my dad used to take me to Boston College basketball games. Okay. When I was a kid, uh, it, they used to have the something called the Robert Center before the Conti Forum. Okay. And so he used to take me on on campus all the time to watch these games. And um, I didn't know the school that well, but I visited and I thought, this is a pretty good option. I applied to some other places, some places I didn't that I wanted to go to, I didn't get in. And I I just I felt like it was it was a good fit um, for me. And and incidentally, also um, I I was raised Catholic, and in fact. Um, my during elementary my elementary school uh, time period i actually went to a catholic school here my parents felt like the newton public schools particularly with the way they treated black children uh were not a good place for me and my sister so you know they put together some money and they put us in there and I, again i was raised catholic so i think that was also a part of a, a sort of secondary part of my decision to go to bc you brought up a really good point that I did when you mentioned that I thought about it as well. The private school aspect for black students, usually parents will kind of sacrifice for their children to go to better schools if they don't think that it'll be a good fit for them. Have you done that? And why do you think that is from maybe the talks that you've had to your parents? So they're going to have I have I done that? Yeah. No. So both of my kids are are in the Newton public schools now. Um, we're still in Newton. Um, Newton, like a lot of districts in the Northeast, face a lot of challenges when it comes to race and, and disparities. And I think, you know, one of the things, you know, that I, I think about often, and I, you know, I'm in touch, obviously, we have great teachers, my kids have great teachers, but there are some questions about structures that have been in place um, for many, many years in schools across the country, you know, one of which are curriculum tracks. A lot of districts have these tracks where they put children in different curriculum tracks based on what they think the child is capable of doing, right? So if you immediately have a structure like that, you're immediately starting to segregate and put kids into different places early on. Uh, one of the programs that uh, was started around the time when I became mayor by uh, the principal of Newton North High School, Jen Price, she's no longer there, but her analysis was, look, there's no way anyone can tell me a black child can't perform just as well in an AP class as a white child, because a lot of those classes are predominantly white, you know, kids with that of privilege. Mm -hmm. So she said, let's do something that we haven't done before, which is put the black kids and low income kids into these classrooms with AP, give them the supports that a lot of the white kid, privilege kids have had along the way. And her bet was they're going to perform just as well. And guess what they did? And so I supported that that program wholeheartedly and made sure you know they had funding going. And it's produced real results. It still exists today. One of the the, the interesting books uh, that I'm in the midst of reading is by Heather McGee, The Sum of Us. It just came out. And her point is racism doesn't just hurt kids of color. It hurts all kids. When you're making decisions based on race and there's a history of institutional racism across the board it's going to hurt everyone so my example that i just gave you there's a number of white kids in in curriculum you know lower curriculum classes as well why can't we have high expectations for all kids 
and give them the supports they need and not have that kind of separation. So I think um, it's just an example of how um, how and why, you know, a number of black families do decide not to keep their kids there, put them in another place so that they have a better shot. My parents did that. Uh, but it also, I think, uh, you know, highlights a larger need to reimagine um, how we're doing things, whether it's education, housing, which I mentioned a few minutes ago at the national level as well uh, with public policy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to bringing and highlighting these things in my role at the IOP and getting them in front of the media and public policymakers so that we can nationally sort of rethink these things we continue to do that create large disparities. You did serve as mayor of Newton for eight years and then decided eventually to run for governor of Massachusetts. Eventually, I know you had to drop out, but reflecting back now, how do you think about that moment when you decided that you were going to pull out of that race? It was a very painful, um, very painful decision. I was I was really proud of the campaign and what we were what we were talking about and the issues that we were focused on, um, which I think you know the, the main core of the campaign was about around economic inequality um, and and justice for all people, and that was the theme. And my policies were driven by that. The politics were driven by that. Um, and I was really you know we signed up two thousand people across the state multiracial. I, I was really proud of those things. So it was disappointing that um, I just wasn't able to raise uh, the, the funding that it would have taken to compete um, in the, you know, in the final general election. And I, I you know, I decided, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to go into a general election if I was fortunate enough to win the primary and not have the resources to, to have a, you know, a, a real conversation about where the Commonwealth should go. Um, and I, you know, I had a great campaign team and, you know, my wife and I were really, we struggled with it, but it was the right, it was the right decision uh, at the time. I still think it was the right decision, but, you know, I, I, you know, as I think about it post campaign and leaving that um, experience, you know, I'm still, as you could see, passionate about these issues and the inequities that, that need to be addressed for all people. And um, I'm certainly bringing that, my sort of intellectual and, and energy and everything else to the positions uh, that, that, that I have taken recently and I'm taking now. Yeah, the experience definitely has and will continue to prepare you for the roles that you have now. You mentioned how important education is and I know with this new role, you're gonna be able to expound upon what you've already done, but maybe fast forwarding a little bit, when you look back or others look back on your career, whether it's in politics, or in education, how do you want to be remembered in future Black History Month? Oh goodness, that's quite <laughs> that's quite a question. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I one of the things I'm most proud of is uh, talking to people, particularly young people, that have read about my story that want to run for office or get into public life. If there's one thing that I do uh, that I might make time for during the day, is is sitting down virtually, you know, previously not, you know, vir virtual, but virtually, and really trying to provide uh, my insights and mentorship so that I can um, plant some seeds and uh, encourage people that that uh, want to make the country and their community fairer for all people. So, you know, what's most important for, for me is that, is that legacy of, of, of raising the next a generation of public servants, and also um, raising the level of consciousness about um, what needs to happen to to really make, as they say, this this country meet its uh, its full potential, and and all the aspirational, lofty language that's been talked about. You know, just planting that seed of consciousness about what the next steps are, and hopefully energizing people, even if they don't get involved with running for office. They are involved and invested in, in making the country better for all people. Final question, kind of a fun one. You're obviously in politics and I'm sure you're very passionate about it, but you have to decompress and be someone outside of work. So what do you do when it comes to maybe mental health or just like decompressing outside of work? So 
I cannot survive without my bike. I have a, okay. <laughs> I, a cyclist. Um, I do something called the Pan Mass Challenge. I've been doing it. Yeah. It's my 12th year doing it. When I can't ride outside, I have a spinning bike. Um, I, I, I can't start my day with at least, I have to get an hour in on that bike or else I'm in deep trouble during the day. So that's my, um, that's my other thing. And the other thing I just, I'm trying to get my kid. We have, you know, I love playing basketball with my children. My kid, my daughter is 12 and my son is nine. Uh, so anytime we can get out and do that, that's another thing. They, I realize they're 12 and died now. And they think it's fun to hang out with dad, but I suspect that may not be the case. <laughs> <laughs> with her dad, I completely understand. <laughs> <laughs> I will say also, you made me feel terrible. Like you said, an hour on the bike at minimum. I can only do twenty right now, but now I'm motivated to do even more. <laughs> that's pretty. That's good though. That's good. You know, and then you can up it a little bit. You know, I know I need to. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, Seti Warren. Congratulations on the new role. I'm looking forward to following what you've been doing. And thank you again for joining NBC 10 Boston today. So great to be here. I really, really have enjoyed uh, this conversation. Thank you.